All we need to do is go take a look at the public health statistics that are gathered by the states themselves, the states that reformed their cannabis laws several years ago, and to understand the effects of that reform. And if you do, what you find is a very consistent pattern. Alcohol sales, down. Binge drinking, down. Youth suicide, down. Domestic violence, down. Violent crime, down. Medicaid reimbursements, down. Opioid prescriptions, down. Opioid fatalities, down 25% in medical cannabis states. Right? We know that cannabis can help soldiers readjust to peacetime. We know that it can help couples work their disputes out in a more peaceful way. There's this whole body of effects that cannabis has that I call the overlooked wellness benefits of cannabis, right? And obviously they include things like epilepsy and Alzheimer's, all the grave illnesses that cannabis can help ameliorate or even cure, right? But there's a whole other body of things that cannabis can do. And I'm thinking about the way that cannabis can extend your patients can wake up your sense of play, can spark your creativity, can heighten your appreciation of nature, can teach you ways to resolve disputes uh, more peacefully, right? Uh, all of these things, that the way that cannabis can uh, 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 deepen your appreciation of the flavor of a meal or the sound of music, right, or the touch of your lover's skin, the way that cannabis can help a poet find just the right word or a painter find just the right color or a musician find just the right note. These things are not like, they're not about getting high, they're not about escaping, they're not about getting blotto. Cannabis is about enhancing the most valuable and precious parts of our lives. Boom, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still at the New West Summit, which is the world's largest tech cannabis conference. We are very, very blessed to have Steve D'Angelo joining us on the show now. Thanks for having me, Alan. Really pleased to be here, man. This is such a pleasure. It's an honor. Uh, you've been just a huge figure in this industry leading, pioneering so many fronts, um, just author of Cannabis Manifesto, founder of Steep Hill Labs, uh, founder of Harborside, and now a chair emeritus, also the star of Weed Wars. There's just so much to unpack about your involvement um, and also just about the history. So we'll, we'll do as good of a job as we can in the short time that we have of doing so. I think that what you what what you were really teaching me towards you know throughout the entire conversation we were having prior to this is just you know we just finished our chat right before we started this by saying that it's been a lot of blood sweat and tears to get us here um that we can just walk into a dispensary and get something that can actually help us with our health and maybe you know talk about your journey through it some of your maybe highest peaks or lowest troughs and just like tell us about just that viewing Sure. You know, I mean, to to the outside, the the development of the legal cannabis industry can look like this overnight sensation that just happened really fast. Right. Um, but it actually was the result of a multi-generation struggle for social justice. And uh, it goes all the way back to 1964 when Allen Ginsberg formed the first organization in the United States to legalize cannabis. That organization was called LIMAR, Legalized Marijuana, right? uh, back in 64. And, and, and he didn't get a whole lot of traction for a while, but in 1970, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws was formed. And in 1971, the Youth International Party, the Yippies, of which I was a part, did the first annual Fourth of July smoke-in in front of the White House. Right? And through the 1970s, we claimed a lot of territory, something like 11 or more states decriminalized their cannabis laws. And in 1979, Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, endorsed the idea of nationwide decriminalization of cannabis, right? He said famously that the punishment for a crime should not cause more harm than the crime itself would cause. And 
So we actually saw a lot of progress in the 1970s, um, but that progress was undone in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was elected and he and Nancy Reagan started the Just Say No campaign, the Dare campaign. We started seeing all these eggs on TV screens that were frying and they were supposed to look like our brains on drugs, right? So uh, the 1980s basically saw a rollback. Most of those uh, laws that had been passed, the decriminalization laws, were reversed with recriminalization laws. Uh, And the 1980s really was the most grim time to be a cannabis activist. Um, It felt like it must have felt to be in Germany at the dawn of fascism. it was scary. It was a scary time. Uh, and we didn't make much progress through that decade uh, until the very end. At the very end of the decade, tragically, well, we saw the explosion of the AIDS crisis in San Francisco. And, um, and, and it was out of that crucible of misery and suffering that, that we finally grew the power to tell people about this plant and start changing opinions. So, the AIDS crisis hits, and my friend Dennis Perone, Vietnam vet, gay man, proud cannabis dealer, notices that people who are consuming cannabis, people with AIDS who are consuming cannabis, live longer and have a higher quality of life than people who aren't consuming cannabis. And once we realize that, once Dennis realizes that, he then dedicates his life to making sure that those AIDS patients have the medicine that they, that they need. And uh, he did this in, in very, very public ways, um, uh, got busted multiple times, got shot uh, in the buttocks uh, by cops, which could have hit his spine and killed him. Um, And really just persisted uh, in doing this. Uh, 1991, despite being arrested over and over again for distributing medical cannabis, Dennis became the prime organizer of Proposition P, which was the very first voter initiative to legalize medical cannabis. It was a city of San Francisco initiative. It passed overwhelmingly uh, in 1991. Five years later, uh, Dennis was one of the key organizers to pass Prop 215, which was the statewide version of Prop P. And of course, it was, it was that passage of medical cannabis in California that really kicked off the modern era of cannabis reform and the cannabis reform movement. Oh, man. The, <clears throat> the, the, the sort of, even at the, the earliest parts, wh- whenever cannabis was first even introduced to humanity until now has been an insane journey. And you really brought us into, uh, you know, the Carter, Reagan, uh, uh, Perone, um, and then now kind of I, I, landscape. That was, what, 40 years um, of time about. And it, this is something that what, what, why, why ever it evolved with us, cannabis and humans, there's a deeper potential story and narrative for why it's a plant that is so deeply spiritually connecting, deeply health. Um, there's so many other benefits and properties to the textile aspect of it, too, that it seemed to have been restricted. Well, look, my, my friend Jack Herrer, another one of the great pioneers, said cannabis can save the world. Um, and, and when Jack said that 20 plus years ago, it was just a promise. It was just a conjecture. But now we actually have proof that Jack was right. All we need to do is go take a look at the public health statistics that are gathered by the states themselves, the states that reformed their cannabis laws several years ago, and to understand the effects of that reform. And if you do, what you find is a very consistent pattern, alcohol sales, down, binge drinking, down, youth suicide, down, domestic violence, down, violent crime, down, Medicaid reimbursements, down, opioid prescriptions, down, opioid fatalities, down 25% in medical cannabis states, right? We know that cannabis can help soldiers readjust to peacetime. We know that it can help couples work their disputes out in a more peaceful way, right? So, since we understand that cannabis has all of these amazing benefits on some some serious social problems, right? 
that's pretty measurable. We can measure the impact on violent crime. We can measure the impact on domestic violence. We can measure the impact on, 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 on risky behavior and addiction, right? It's more difficult to measure the impact that cannabis might have on some of our really amazing, huge social problems that we're facing, right? Like racism, like warfare, like homophobia, like sexism, like the fact that our planet is heating up so fast that we're not going to have a planet to live on if we don't come to our senses and do something about it, right? So cannabis has the power to, to activate us in all of these ways. And, and, and if somebody has a better way to pull us back, <clears throat> if somebody has a better way to pull us back from the brink of destruction, from killing ourselves with nuclear weapons or cooking the planet into a cinder, then I'd like them to bring it to me because I haven't found anything better than cannabis yet. Yeah, I really appreciated your list of ways that cannabis helps humans and that that needs to be unleashed in its fullest into our world. Ooh, but those yeah. lists, right? Those effects, those are like, those are some of the, of the more obvious effects. But there's this whole body of effects that cannabis has that I call the overlooked wellness benefits of cannabis, right? And obviously they include things like epilepsy and Alzheimer's, all the grave illnesses that cannabis can help ameliorate or even cure, right? But there's a whole other body of things that cannabis can do. And I'm thinking about the way that cannabis can extend your patience, can wake up your sense of play, can spark your creativity, can heighten your appreciation of nature, can teach you ways to resolve disputes uh, more peacefully, right? Uh, all of these things, the, the way that cannabis can uh, 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 deepen your appreciation of the flavor of a meal or the sound of music, right, or the touch of your lover's skin, the way that cannabis can help a poet find just the right word or a painter find just the right color or a musician find just the right note. These things are not like, they're not about getting high, they're not about escaping, they're not about getting blotto. Cannabis is about enhancing the most valuable and precious parts of our lives. You are yourself a poet about it. I love it. I love it so much. Yeah, I fell in love with this plant when I was 13 years old, man. It's been a love affair ever since then. So, yeah. And even a moment ago when I pushed back just a tiny bit on, you know, well, why is it that then it, the, the certain dosages of certain cannabinoids can cause anxiety in people and you said that it's an educational issue uh, that if we had a proper education of what cannabis has how it impacts us on an individual basis proper research and science on every single strain that these types of things wouldn't be happening we would have a greater depth and insight into somebody prior to them taking it's just a whole educational issue and i i yeah i tend i tend to agree with you that that's that's that that's true um well that kind of gets you know gets to my book the cannabis manifesto and the very first chapter in that book uh has a statement that's attached to it the statement is that cannabis isn't harmful but prohibition is right and so when you think about something like anxiety reactions well one of the things that we've been hearing now is that some people have anxiety reactions to to cannabis right well, I think that those anxiety reactions are largely a construction of prohibition rather than an effect of the plant. So in, in, in the darkness of prohibition, people were buying untested cannabis. They didn't know what the cannabinoid or terpene profile was. There was no way for them to understand the, dose, the dosage. There was no place for them to go for accurate information about what to expect from the experience, right? Now, you can walk into a dispensary, Right. It's the cannabis is tested. It's labeled with its it, its cannabinoid and terpene profile. You can talk to somebody on the other side of that counter at the dispensary and give you a good idea of what it is that you're going to expect. Right, and under those circumstances, you see a lot less anxiety and panic reactions than you do in the underground market, where somebody buys something they don't really know what it is. They don't really know how strong it is. They eat one. They don't feel anything for ten or fifteen minutes, so they eat another one. 
They another 10 or 15 go, they ate another one because nobody told them that you have to wait 45 minutes before you feel the effect, right? And of course, you have people having bad reactions under those circumstances, right? But if you normalize it, if you give people something that's clearly labeled, if they know what to expect, if they're educated in how to use it, you don't see those problems. Again, this is that whole, we've been doing it for so long and you're very aware of how to ameliorate a lot of these a lot of these issues and how to potentially guide us into the future of this. Mm -hmm.